Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing outside of 49 Old Compton Street in Soho, W1. Directly opposite the unsolved killing of Dutch Leia. Six doors west of the bombing of the Admiral Duncan pub. And three doors east of the not-so-tragic demise of the cruel vulture of Soho. Coming soon to Murder Mile. At 49 Old Compton Street, currently stands a four-storey red brick monstrosity, with six crappy flats above, housing, as witnessed on my old tour, one of the rudest assholes in the whole of Soho. And on the ground floor stands a shop, which could be open, closed, or empty, as with every new tenant coming up with a genius idea to sell just one item whether croissants, hand-cut crisps, or hummus. They all appear shocked when their entrepreneurial dream shuts, having not had a single customer. Back in 1894, this building was a modestly priced hotel called Blondell's. Set over four floors, with ten rooms per level, a bathroom per floor, and a restaurant on the ground. Blondell's became a home from home for many businessmen, travellers, and even clergymen from all corners of the world. On the 15th of September, 1894, being partway through a world tour to spread the word of God, Father Louis Caceres, a portly elderly priest, had booked a room for himself and his faithful assistant, Eugene. But growing depressed at his failing health, and as the tour took its toll, here the priest would take his own life. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 213, Finished with Life. The Suicide of Father Louis Caceres. Everybody has a breaking point. For the elderly, once their will is gone, their bodies simply slip away. Whereas for those who still have a life to live, the only way to reach the eternal sleep is by their own hand. For Father Louis Caceres, every problem in his life came to a head on Old Compton Street. Little is known about the life of Father Louis, for obvious reasons. Said to be a native of the South American country of Peru, Father Louis came from money, being the son of a wealthy trader who enjoyed all the pomp and privilege that came with such a high status. Unlike many in his country, Louis was well educated, being fluent in Spanish, English and Latin, with his handwriting as neat as any scribe and his spelling and grammar was nothing short of faultless. But although his family's wealth kept him shielded from the poverty of his country, it also broke his heart. At an early age, Louis found God, and making it his mission to help those less fortunate than himself, he joined the church as an altar boy, and in his teens he joined the seminary where he learned to live a humble and decent life, where the whole ethos of his education was to live as simply as Jesus had. Which was easier said than done, when the church was a place of privilege and excess. Being a brown-bricked monument to God's wonder, stretching to the sky which dwarfed the shacks in its shadow, and being stuffed full of ornate manuscripts, golden icons, and sparkling stained glass windows, which, 
if sold, could feed and clothe the community for a year. It filled him full of conflict, that as the priests in their silk robes asked the poor to donate, the church was, and still is, the world's largest landowner. The church was a contradiction of wealth and poverty, made all the more confusing by his upbringing. Father Louis liked his food, and being well-traveled, he always ate well, whether pheasant, quail, caviar or pate, with a sherry or a flute of champagne from time to time, and maybe even a cigar. And burdened by a sweet tooth, he was not adverse to demolishing a pudding or two, shoveling in a few sweeties into his unoccupied pie hole, or sampling a merest morsel of cake should he pass any bakery. When he was young, this excessive consumption wasn't much of a problem, as although being a little man of barely five foot tall, his health could carry his bulk. But as he entered his sixties, and his weight ballooned to 18 stone. This additional chunkage put a real strain on his limbs, his lungs, and his heart. Being shaped like a well-stuffed donut, when he walked, his jowls wobbled like a glorious jelly, and his ankle fat billowed over his shoes like an over-generous pie crust. But with his lungs wheezing like a broken accordion, Every step he walked felt like a mile, and every breath was like a battle to find air. So it may seem surprising that in the spring of 1893, Father Louis Caceres decided to leave his native Peru and set sail on a world tour to spread the word of God. It was never said why he chose that moment to leave. Maybe he felt the change of scenery would be beneficial to his health. Maybe he wanted to flee his family and the excesses of the church. Or maybe he felt this was his last chance to do good. It was a journey which would cover South America, North America, Europe and England. But having arrived in Soho, he would never return home. As a man described as being in comfortable worldly circumstances, the world tour of Father Luis was entirely self-financed. As into the Banco de Londres y Rio de la Plata in Buenos Aires, he deposited 400 pounds roughly 50,000 pounds today. And with its branches across the Americas, but also in London and France, all he needed was a notarized letter of credit to allow him to withdraw any money at any time. Remarkably, the Central American leg of his trip went without a hitch. But with him no longer being a spring chicken, but more of a fatted duck, even the simplest of duties became a mission for Luis. Therefore, it was a blessing when Luis met Eugene, a man more than half his age and three times his strength, who was a devout Catholic, spoke French, moderate English, had worked in Paris and London, and as an out-of-work chef who desperately needed a job. He was more than thrilled if not honoured, to assist this well-respected priest in return for a warm bed, free meals and a small wage. As this priest's personal assistant, Eugene was invaluable. He carried his luggage, he made his meals, he rearranged his itinerary when Louis got too weak and he ensured that every bill was paid on time. By August 1894, having arrived in Paris, 
much of the priest's planned schedule was scrapped. As having become slower and weaker, any trips to local charities had to be sidelined in place of bed rest. And it wasn't just the priest's strength which was being sapped. So was his mood. Gone was the jolly man with the hearty laugh. As in its place stood a sullen man who slumped with every fading footstep. Whether life had lost its meaning, or he knew that every breath may be his last. As they travelled from Paris to Dieppe, Father Louis had even lost his love of food. Pushing a fine French cassoulet to the side of his plate, even the one true love in his life couldn't rouse this fading light from towards the darkness. On the 14th of September 1894, Louis and Eugene arrived in New Haven on the English south coast. As neither anywhere new, or even a haven, except for drunken sailors and lost deadbeats, they bedded down in a cheap B&B for one night. And although Father Louis should have called it quits on the tour and headed home to Peru, on the 15th of September, they arrived amongst the sprawling smog of London. As a priest, Soho was an odd choice. A godless hole riddled with the excesses of cruelty and corruption. A fetid pit piled high with the shattered souls of the debauched. And with every street stained with the acrid stench of drink, drugs, sex and sin. Across the world, Soho was synonymous as a place where unlawful death was common. And even the innocent were killed for just a few pounds to satisfy the cravings of a dope fiend. But Soho was where he chose to stay. And it was also where he would die. Blondell's at 49 Old Compton Street was an affordable but decent hotel with soft beds, clean sheets, running water, a chambermaid service if required, and a restaurant on the ground floor for all meals. As his assistant, Eugene booked them into a twin room on the third floor overlooking the street. It was small and simple, with the priest's bed nearest the window so the air could aid his recovery. As a priest, although unknown to these denizens of Soho, Father Louis was respected. And knowing that his sickness was being attended to by his faithful assistant, who fetched his meals and also his medicine, although his hacking cough would echo the halls, the staff gave him the privacy that this man of the cloth required. Over those three weeks that Father Luis was in Soho, he never left his room and he rarely left his bed. Stuck staring at a blank wall, as he gripped his crucifix in his hand, he pondered whether his time had come, or if, for the sins he was never absolved of, whether of the heart or the mind, that God had abandoned him. According to Eugene, Father Louis was a good man, but even his faith couldn't save him. At Father Louis's request, on Wednesday the 3rd of October, Eugene went to Banco de Londres y Rio de la Plata with a letter of credit signed by the priest. And with his ID, he withdrew £30, roughly £4,000 today. As was their routine, 
clearing the bills to the end of the week. For a laundry, a bakery, and even a charity. As requested, Eugene paid 17 shillings to the Hotel Blondel, covering their stay until the coming Sunday. That afternoon, as had become all too common, Father Louis was heard coughing and choking as his body failed him once again. And having become increasingly depressed, he decided that he was done. On the morning of Sunday the 7th of October, four days later, the chambermaid came to change the sheets. As by all accounts, their checkout time had elapsed and some new guests were due to move in. Hearing nothing familiar, no snoring, no coughing and no choking, she assumed the priest had left. But opening the unlocked door, there she found his body. Dressed in just a pair of silk pyjamas, although a deep indentation of his corpulent body remained on the mattress where he'd spent the last three weeks of his life, Father Louis was not in bed. Being too large and too sickly to get to his feet, Dr. Severs of Gerard Street would confirm he had lied upon his bed, tied the ends of the silk handkerchief together, and with the loop over his head and the bed frame, he put his feet on the ground and rolled himself out of bed, and thereby strangling himself. Found lying face up, with his lips blue, his tongue out, and his eyes protruding. A pool of blood flowing from his nostrils was consistent with asphyxiation. And with the greater part of his body, his legs, his trunk, and his right elbow, resting on the floor. Although his head was just a few inches off the floor, it was a strange way to die. But being too sick to stand, the doctor said it was entirely possible. With no bruises to his body and no signs of a struggle or an assault, the room told a similar tale. As none of the furniture was disarranged, his luggage trunks were in the corner and his slippers were to the side of the bed, as if either they had fallen off or he had taken them off prior to taking his own life. On his bedside table lay two things. A loaded six-shot revolver with no cartridges spent. And his suicide note. Handwritten in Spanish, his final words were To the inspector of the police. Dear sir, do not accuse anybody of my death. I am finished with life. I am disgusted with my family. I do not require any noise after my death. I have no papers. I do not wish anybody to know my other motives. Once more, please keep silence in order that there may be no scandal. May God bless you. Father Luis Caceres, a native of Peru. At 10 a.m., Mr. Blondell, the hotel's proprietor, called James Spindelow, the coroner's officer, to state that one of his lodgers had hanged himself. Dr. Severs of Gerard Street confirmed this as the cause of death. And as was standard practice, Detective Inspector Greet of Scotland Yard headed up an investigation.
It was as clear a case of suicide as anyone had ever seen. But the hardest part was identifying the priest. Liaising with the Spanish and Peruvian consuls. As Father Luis had no papers upon his person, and it was believed that, as his assistant, Eugene had possibly been sent on a religious mission to a godforsaken place in the wilds of somewhere nowhere near. Until confirmed, an inquest was held at St. Anne's Church on Dean Street into the death of an unknown priest believed to be Father Luis Caceres. Headed up by Harold Smith, the newly appointed coroner for Westminster, on the 9th of October 1894, with the jury having listened to the expert witness testimony of the chambermaid, the hotel proprietor, the police inspector, and Dr. Severs, who had performed the autopsy. The inquest took just 30 minutes to reach a verdict of death by suicide, while the balance of his mind was disturbed. And with that, the case was closed. The room was cleaned, his belongings went into storage, and although he had committed the ultimate sin which negated his ascent to heaven, the body of Father Luis Caceres was shipped back to Peru, and until his details could be determined, he was buried in a temporary grave. And there our story ends. A sickly priest who came to Soho and growing ever more depressed took his own life. Only the inquest jury would call bullshit. The ruling of death by suicide was based on the evidence put before them. But having read up further about the case in the Pall Mall Gazette, which contained details that neither the jury nor the coroner even knew, and as was their right, having seen the hotel room with the body in situ before attending the inquest, the jury found huge gaping holes in the case and requested that the coroner insist on the second inquest. As is the role of any inquest, with the first one described as hurried and anything but searching, the second opened just two days later, ensure that this taxpaying jury who funded this hogwash made full use of their right to pose questions to those expert witnesses. And when they did, they had a lot to say. A series of searing questions were posed by the foreman of the jury to the experts. Dr. Severs, you say this man committed suicide by hanging, but his head was barely off the floor. Indeed I did, sir. It only takes but an inch to hang oneself. I see. But surely if he'd tied the noose and rolled out of bed, he would have been found face down. Whereas this man died face up. And how could a man, even of his bulk, strangle himself if he was face up? At which the doctor ummed and art. But even he couldn't provide a logical answer. To Detective Inspector Greet, the foreman asked, You said there were no signs of a robbery. I did, sir. In your words, nothing was found on the corpse. Not a farthing, sir. But what about elsewhere in the room? What about his papers, his passport, his bank details? The luggage was there, but what was inside? It was an answer the foreman knew as they had seen the crime scene in situ. 
At which the inspector replied, Nothing. Nothing? Not his clothes, nor his priestly robes? Inspector Greet replied, Um, no, sir. And the foreman retorted, And you say there was no robbery? At which the inspector ummed an art, but even he couldn't provide a logical answer. And then there was a suicide note, which had been read in full and taken as fact that it had been written by Father Luis. But having not seen it before, the jury had a few issues with this piece of evidence. The priest was an educated man, was he not? He was. A fluent Spanish speaker being a native of Peru. He was. Hmm. So why, if he wrote this note in his native tongue, was his spelling so atrocious? As not only was it gibberish, but the penmanship was so poor, it looked as if a disabled donkey had scrawled it using a broken crayon. And when the foreman asked, is this the suicide note of a scholarly priest? The inspector had to conclude, possibly not. As the vestry room flooded with a sea of red faces, many of whom had done the bare minimum. Finding insufficient grounds to adopt the medical view that this case was one of suicide, the foreman returned an open verdict, and the police were requested to reinvestigate this case as one of a possible homicide. It didn't take long to find a loose thread or two in Soho. Some of the priest's clothes were found at a local pawnbroker's, having been sold just a few days earlier. His debts had been paid to the laundry, but from his deathbed, somehow this priest had racked up debts in many pubs, clubs, and even brothels. And having emptied his account at the half branch of his bank just two days after he had died, they eventually discovered that Father Luis Caceres of Peru didn't exist. As having mistakenly taken his registration at the Hotel Blondel as proof, someone had deliberately hidden the fact that the victim was Father Gabriel Tizagoy of Buenos Aires. Only one man knew the truth of what had happened that day, and he had vanished into thin air. Eugene Rubolo, his 24-year-old assistant, had left the Hotel Blondel on the afternoon of Thursday the 4th of October, carrying a small suitcase and being dressed in a fine set of priestly robes. Identifying himself as Father Gabriel T. Segoy, the chief chaplain of the Argentinian Republic, he went unchecked at any border as he caught the boat train from Waterloo to Southampton. And at midnight, hopping the train to La Havre, as a man of God, he was treated with respect and no one dared to question or to bother him. On Friday the 5th of October, Eugene entered Banco de Londres y Rio de la Plata in La Havre. And with the priest's ID and his letter of credit, he closed the full remainder of the account, being £370, roughly £48,000 today. Knowing that such a silly crime scene wouldn't fool anyone, and that the suicide idea was just plain stupid, Eugene fled as far as he could and caught a French liner from La Havre to New York. Whereas a respected priest, with money to pay his way, he booked into modestly priced hotels and laid low for a while. His escape was swift. In fact, his fling was faster than any reporting of the case in the press. 
as by the time he had arrived in New York. He was overjoyed to read an article in an American newspaper, which declared, An inquest in Soho. London has ruled the death of an unknown Peruvian priest as suicide. Based on this article, Eugene had committed the perfect murder. But by the time that the news of the second inquest would be reported, he would be too drunk, stoned and shagged out to know the truth. Burning through the money like his pockets were on fire, Eugene blew a wad on fancy hotels, fine wines, sexy fillies, and enough white powder to reline an entire football pitch. And although this was an era where priests were as corrupt as the police, causing too much of a stink in the core of the Big Apple, he hopped the next liner to France and fled back to his hometown of Toulon in the south of France where he lived a raucous life, full of champagne, cocaine, and prostitutes. The excesses of Eugene Ribolo came to an end barely a month later, on the 6th of November, 1894, when two men were arrested for starting a drunken bar fight in Toulon, one of whom was dressed as a priest and gave the name and ID of Father Gabriel T. Segoya, a man who had supposedly committed suicide. With Scotland Yard notified of his arrest, and with almost none of the money left, all he had to show for his month of fun was a black eye, a hangover, a dirty set of priest robes and a knackered penis. Charged with the murder of Father Segoy, British police unsuccessfully tried to extradite him back to London. So being a French citizen, he was ultimately tried in the Court of Assizes in Paris. To determine if foul play had occurred, the priest's body was exhumed and a thorough autopsy was conducted leading to a new investigation which took almost a year to bring to court. Tried on the 20th of January, 1896, Eugene Ribolo was found guilty of robbery and fraud. But with murder impossible to prove, the jury granted him extenuating circumstances, and he was sentenced to hard labour for life. The likelihood is that the priest was strangled to death by his assistant for the sake of money. It was far from being the perfect murder, but he almost got away with it, owing to the failure of three expert witnesses. A doctor, a coroner and a detective, who were too unwilling to see beyond the obvious, that on the surface, Although it looked like a suicide, a priest had been murdered in Soho. wasn't terrible <laughs> oh hello everyone oh i'll take your little hat off there we go god yeah i didn't know if i could do that one well welcome to extra mile unscripted unedited i haven't done this for a while oh dear so uh i got myself ahead of the game because i was going away on a stag do in uh, uh naples and uh uh, I get myself into the game. I thought, go, go away on the stag do, come back, do lots of research. Uh, and fortunately, on the first day of the stag do, I got bronchitis. It's lovely, lovely, lovely uh, ailment to have. So, um, yeah, so all the work I did to get myself ahead of the game. Unfortunately, I've spent the last couple of weeks in bed with my lungs full of uh, horrible mucus. Ch coughing up mucus, couldn't sleep. It's been horrible. Bloody bronchitis. So I'm just getting through it now. My lungs are... 
because I was coughing up so much and uh, having to cough, cough out all the, you can't believe how much mucus is in your lungs. Could, oh, couldn't lie down, couldn't sit up, couldn't walk. Even though when I was on the stag do, I didn't realise I'd got bronchitis at the time. I climbed Mount Vesuvius with fucked lungs. Oh, God. It, I had to do it in like 10 steps and a rest, 10 steps and a rest. It's killed me. Oh. <coughs> so my lungs still aren't 100% yet. Oh, I can't do hills yet. And I struggled to talk for too long. But I managed to record this episode, which is a miracle. So I tell you what, let me... Shall I get, grab myself a tea? Let's get, let's get me a tea. Uh, I've got a chocolate donut, which I'm going to have in a bit. Uh, let's pop that in there. There we go. I might have a herbal tea. That might do me some do me some good, I think. An herbal. Let's have a, a peppermint. Yeah. My life is exciting. I'm off to do my laundry in a bit. Oh, life is good. Oh, Michael, your exciting life. So, uh, yeah. So, because um, I was bed bound for quite a bit. And, oh, it's horrible when you can't sleep because you can't focus. You can't do anything. You just, I filled up a bin bag full of tissues. It was like being a teenage boy again. But it was full of mucus. It was horrible. Green, horrible mucus. Oh, until someone pointed out that you can get this stuff that you can drink and it makes your mucus not so claggy. It makes it a bit softer and it's easy. Oh, you just get a headache from just coughing all the time. So my lungs were a bit bit messed up. So uh, anyway, managed to do that this episode. So um, when my brain, I could get my brain back in order because I couldn't talk. Like family are very nice, but family are calling me up and go, I'm just calling up to see how you are. And it's like, I've already told you I can't talk because every time I talk, I have a coughing fit. Yeah, but I just wanted to see how you are. It's like, why not just, why not just text me? Oh, people are nice, but sometimes they don't think. So yeah, um, so I'm only really getting down to talking now, which is great. So able to almost get through um, that episode of Murder Mile without coughing. Oh, it sounds like uh, my water's done. I hope I put water in the kettle. Maybe I didn't. Oh, I did. A little bit. Not enough, but it'll do. That'll do, pig. That'll do. Right. So let's, uh, as always, if you're new to Extra Mile, uh, we'll do a quiz in a bit, and then I'll, I'll dive into some extra stuff to do with this case. Um, if you came to see <coughs> some of the live shows that I did with uh, Paul from UK uh, a True Crime Enthusiast and Adam from UK True Crime, you will partially recognize that story uh, maybe because that was one of the stories i told there but obviously i need a little bit of time so i can only tell you a little bit of it but this is the full story this is everything um i don't uh i wasn't gonna, not planning to use that story again so i thought i oh, will turn it into an episode there we go uh what else? oh oh before we dive into quiz questions a big thank you to new patreon supporter kim kirkham so thank you kim uh thank you for becoming a patreon supporter you get all the all the lots of goodies that are included in this so there you go thank you uh let's dive into some quiz questions so don't forget we'll do the answers very shortly question number one what was the name of the hotel that's a nice easy one and don't forget i'll probably balls it up in a second anyway Question number two, what was the height of Father Luis? Question number three, what was the weight of Father Luis? All relatively easy, aren't they? Question number four, how much was in the uh, bank account? Uh, how much was in Father Luis's bank account by the time he arrived in England? Question number five, in what seaside town did they stay prior to uh, arriving in Soho? Oh, the burpees. Ugh. Question number six is porridge burpees. Question number six, what was the name of the doctor who said it was a suicide? Question number seven, what was used to strangle Father Luis? I'm calling him Father Luis, but don't forget his name isn't Father Luis. And question number eight, what was, uh, what was to the side of the bed on the floor? Uh, in the in the room i've only done eight questions there you could tell that i wasn't in good shape when i was <coughs> writing this and writing the questions i could only come up with eight questions uh let's dive into these so uh so these are the fake details uh father luis caceres a native of peru as we now know uh he wasn't father luis caceres this was a name invented by eugene to uh so clearly he was planning this in advance. Clearly he deliberately uh, wanted to throw people off the track. So he, uh, in advance, he'd probably 
he'd probably all decided he was father louis or father gabriel as he was uh, was either going to die naturally and he was going to rob him or he was going to going to kill him uh very nice very nice man um the they kind of describe Father Luis as elderly, but by the details that I can see, he only seems to be about 50 years old. Uh, maybe that was elderly for then. Um, real name, fa- uh, Father uh, Gabriel T. Segoy, uh, an Argentinian priest, originally from Peru, but raised in uh, uh, Argentina, uh, of the Holy Order of uh, Buenos Aires, a highly respected member of a Peruvian family in the Argentinian Republic. So technically it was true. He was a native of Peru, but uh, if they went there, they wouldn't find a Caceres there, or Father Luis Caceres there, because that wasn't his name. Uh, he, he was actually from another country. Uh, the uh, All seems to be self-financed, so... <clears throat> it seems to come from a, a relatively wealthy family um uh, don't forget this is kind of an era where um uh, priests are very respected they can go anywhere they don't get arrested for things they can do what they like uh, if you're a priest you can go into a hotel and drink lots of champagne and not pay the bill and people will be like oh do you know it's 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 it's, it's a a priest is a respected man we, we're honored to have you here it's that kind of era so um therefore kind of it's a good it's a good disguise for eugene to kind of disappear dressed as a priest because he knows he can just he, no one's going to check him no one's going to um no one's going to check his paperwork or if they do they'll just go yeah it's a priest brilliant great come on board sorry 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 father sorry father uh eugene in uh some of the details call him eugene ribolo uh, others call him victor ribolo it's believed his his name may have been eugene victor ribolo uh he's a french immigrant uh, apparently he'd lived in buenos aires for two years uh he became he was a cook um 10 to 12 years prior to the murder he was employed as a chef in a london restaurant i can't find out which one uh so he knew because he's french he knew uh, he'd worked in paris before he'd worked in london before he seems to have made his way to buenos aires and it's on the journey back for, uh somewhere through uh central america that either it well, could be either in buenos aires or, or somewhere in central america that he met i'm going to keep calling him father luis because that's what we know him as in this episode but that's where they seem to have met we don't really know much about the journey at all so um um seem to have gotten well together it seems odd that uh the priest didn't seem to have an, someone to aid him given the fact that he was inverted commas old and uh rather large and unhealthy he, he seems to struggle have walked and if he considered the fact that he would have needed someone to carry his bags for him um maybe he was reliant on the idea that he would turn up in different places places he would go to the local church and say oh look it's me and they go oh we'll sort everything out for you father maybe that's what he was used to so so actually maybe having an assistant was something different or maybe he had an assistant who just gave up i don't know um there is uh, one thing that's odd there does seem to be a, a revolver in the room so we know that was eugene's revolver uh a similar one was found uh next to the body this is not one of the quiz questions um uh, a young lady who had been chatting to eugene at the local tobacconist shop she'd seen him with that revolver attached to his waist with a cord um we don't know why he had the gun with him uh we don't know why he left it behind as well this is what makes it really weird so um hotel itself uh, doesn't exist anymore this was uh, the building was demolished it looked like it was demolished in the 50s if you go into old compton street you will see uh compton's which used to be the swiss hotel it's it's just to the left of that and it's immediately opposite dutch layers uh where dutch layer was murdered uh what else is there um small room uh two bedded so twin bedded on the third floor uh, a very simple room it seems to be quite a modest little uh, place but you could get your food there it just seems odd that they would pick soho as the place to go to there's so many places in and around london that they could go to 
maybe they wanted to be near the church St Anne's we don't know we really don't know there's a lot of details about this case that's missing it was reported but it wasn't well reported in the press so there's a lot that's missing there's a lot of information as always which is uh not particularly uh accurate um last bill was paid wednesday the 3rd of october eugene paid the bill for the hotel which was 17 shillings um during the three weeks that they were there uh they regularly made sure that the bills were always paid on time uh they, they had no debts so whenever whenever they they had a meal they would always pay for the meal they'd never put it on account so um eugene and the priest were very well trusted and respected um when eugene left uh obviously he was dressed as a priest um he seems to have taken the uh the priest's robes so i was going to get this to this in a bit but the um the jury on the inquest so this is back in an air uh, back in a time when the jury at inquest they had the right to go and see the body in situ and normally what would happen is uh if, if you go back to the episode where uh heiss the german guy the the, the the episode called the jealous streak uh when heiss uh killed himself or cut his own throat um the inquest was held at St Anne's as well and they had the right to go and see the body so the body had to be left exactly where it was uh, but because the inquest was three days later the body was left in the room for three days and quite often you'll see this happens is that because they need the body to stay where it is unless it's all unless it's not dead and it's been moved to a hospital if it is dead they have to leave it there so the jury can come in look at the room look at the body look at everything around not touch anything get an idea of it and then the room can be cleared up um so in this case the jury turned up at the room uh they saw the body uh of father Luis hanging next to the bed uh they saw uh the suicide note had been removed by that point which is why they um they weren't they hadn't seen the handwriting but they were aware of it uh the suitcases were there but the suitcases were empty the police seem to have done it i absolutely I, I i'm not normally one of these people who goes oh the police did a terrible job which i know some people love to do but in this case it really did a terrible job really everyone involved did a terrible job they really did so it's only because of the the, the inquest jury who'd seen the scene they they were just like this doesn't make any sense at all none of this makes sense it doesn't it looks like it could be a suicide but it really doesn't look like a suicide uh so yeah eugene got into the 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 priestly ro robes and it, <coughs> he got the boat train from waterloo to southampton that goes on the boat over to france and then he went down to la havre uh he knew la havre anyway uh and he was able to present himself as father father segoy the chief chaplain of the argentine republic uh saying that he was on a furlough in france no yeah, people just let him do what he needed to do he'd got uh he got id on him don't forget this isn't photo id this is just id so it's uh he got a letter of credit he was a priest no one's really gonna no one's really gonna quiz him about this he can just do whatever he wants really uh body was found by the chambermaid the only reason uh, no one ever really <coughs> no one ever uh went into the room uh and check the room at any point uh the only reason that she was going in was because they were checking out on the sunday they'd already meant to have checked out she needed to change the sheets to, to get ready for the new people and she didn't hear any coughing or so, that, that they were used to hearing coughing but they always were like well eugene's looking after him he's sorting out the food and everything like that so you know they had no reason to go in there and that's where she found the body um let's see what there is yeah so next to the bed was the loaded revolver uh six chamber revolver found near his right hand um it's some reports say it was on the the little table next to it but this report here says it's next to his right hand was it placed there it seems odd that you would have a revolver and a suicide and but you would the person has hung themselves and yet you put the gun next to his hand as if he was thinking about killing shooting himself dead it doesn't make any sense um uh, none of the bullets have been fired inside the gun um we don't really know why eugene left his gun there surely he should have taken it with him um we know it definitely wasn't uh the the priests um the letter in spanish 
it was only at the second inquest where they said uh, can we have a look at the uh, the um the suicide note and it was clear that the suicide note it was in spanish which makes sense because it was uh father lewis's language but the the handwriting was terrible the grammar was terrible it wasn't particularly good spanish uh, eugene did speak spanish but he wasn't great at it he was you know he's french he could he could have written it in english if he wanted to and he probably it would have made sense to have done that because it, as it's a letter to the inspector of the police who would be english it makes sense that it would be you write it in english so the inspector can understand it but you, they would accept the fact that the english wouldn't actually be that good that would make more sense but he didn't he decided to write it in spanish which is a language he didn't know but the priest was fluent in absolutely crazy anyway so I, I i read the entire letter to you there it was only a short one uh missing items um there was a, a, le a leather <coughs> travel bag was missing so that was what the priestly robes were in all the papers were in there that's what eugene took um we know that eugene had been there before he he had a prayer book with him uh which he'd accidentally left behind and inside he'd written the inscription alice boyce 1879 so whether that was an old girlfriend or someone you knew or maybe he'd stolen uh, a bible from a lady we don't know don't know at all um uh slightly embarrassing for the priest uh for the police having to dive in and have a have a good old look at uh what they'd missed this is the problem is is that when all the evidence says it's a suicide you look at it you go well it's a suicide and then uh, it's as they say it's like it's confirmation bias isn't it you go well it's a suicide and you find all the pieces of information which confirm that it's a suicide but you wouldn't naturally go well maybe it's a murder i i know if you if you like true crime you would think that you say oh well it must be because it's more exciting but if you're a police police detective doing your job if it's you know if you if you walk into a room and someone's been stabbed in the chest you're not going to go well it's a suicide oh. you would you would naturally go well do you know someone's killed him and if if you find someone hanging are you are you instantly going to go oh i think it was almost certainly his assistant who wanted his money you just wouldn't do that you would just go for the obvious uh which is not to say they didn't do a terrible job they did do a terrible job uh da, 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 don't want to do that bit because that gives away the um the the um the doctor who said it was a suicide the doctor admitted uh there was a strange carefulness on the part of the suicide um when re-questioned he said he wasn't a hundred percent convinced as the body was found lying on his back he finally would admit to that um he did say that given the fa uh, the father's uh weight and his health problems the fact that he was lying face up that he could have killed himself killed himself that way but it's you know it's not it's not the logical way to kill yourself uh, and i think that's it uh oh have i have i done this wrong i might i think i've got more patron uh subscribers to thank oh god i put i might have put them in the wrong place so uh <laughs> i think these are my, my i think this is my other list of patrons see this is the problem my brain was all over the place <coughs> <coughs> or these could have been uh patron subscribers from a previous episode but because that was a month ago i don't know so and we're going to also thank uh lee ville v-i-l-l-e-t-t-t-e -T 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 -E. uh so i hope that's right lee ville mark smith pavel kumster uh connie mcfarlane and kathy carlos i've got a feeling i may have mentioned you in the previous episode but i may not have done so i'm gonna i'm gonna thank you again just in case we become patron subscribers see my brain's not functioning uh lee ville mark smith pavel comster connie mcfarlane and kathy carlos so thank you guys thank you for becoming uh patron subscribers my brain is all over the shop i, I hate being ill oh i really do although the good thing was i got to write the next five episodes of murder mile so there we go which is good and i'm working on uh working on all the uh because the whole point of being ahead of the game was that it gives me time to do the research but because i had to waste 
over three weeks getting well that's ruined on my research time so uh i've been working on some new ideas of things that will be come out soon that i can put out and give myself a bit of a gap so i can do some more research uh but there's there's some really interesting cases coming up right let's do the quiz questions and let's see which ones i ballsed up did i uh no i think i was good i think i was good okay question number one what was the name of the hotel it was called blondell's question number two what was the height of father Luis? he was about five foot tall oh got blocked nose question number three what was the weight of father Luis? he was 18 stone question number four how much was in father Luis's bank account by the time he arrived in england so we had roughly £400 left, which is about £50,000 today. Question number five. In what seaside town did they stay prior to Soho? New Haven. As someone who unfortunately has uh, spent a night in New Haven, I can say that it is not new and it's definitely not a haven, except for drunks and deadbeat. Oh, New Haven was horrible. Sorry to anyone who may live in New Haven, but... I th- maybe I maybe I saw the 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 not nice side of it, but it was, wasn't nice. It wasn't nice because I went from Dieppe, which was relatively nice for a seaside port, then you go to New Haven and you go, "Ooh, fuck." Uh, question number six: What was the name of the doctor who said it was a suicide? It was Doctor Severs. Question seven: What was used to strangle Father Louis? <coughs> a silk handkerchief. And question number eight, what was to the side of the bed on the floor? It was his slippers. So there you go. There you go, folk. So I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, for episode 213. Um, I can't remember what next week is. My brain's not functioning. Ooh, right i've got to go off and wash uh do all my laundry are oh, fun but then i get to go to the bakery and they've got the big uh belgian buns made with um uh, lemon curd yummy and then i get to sit in my little coffee shop and i'll start editing this God, i'm glad i've got this first one ed- edited uh first one recorded right thank you to everyone for supporting the show it's very much appreciated uh have yourself a good week stay safe uh be good don't get sick like i did uh horrible uh best wishes lots of love everyone